In this video you can learn all about the risks and the realities of electric vehicle fires from one of the world's leading researchers. So this webinar is about electric vehicle fires because as the electric vehicles take over from internal combustion engines, that's ice, petrol and diesel, mm. like it or not, that's going to happen. Now, there is a fire risk with any form of vehicle, electrical or otherwise, and electric vehicles pose a different type of fire risk to that of the ICE vehicles which, that we're used to. Now, we're lucky to have Emma from EV Firesafe talking to us, and we're going to talk about what electric vehicle fires are, the risks, how they're different from ICE vehicles, and a whole bunch of other topics. So welcome, Emma. Thank you very much for taking the time. And could you just give us a brief introduction to yourself and EV Firesafe, please? Sure. Um, so Emma Sutcliffe, I'm the project director of of EV Firesafe. So we're a private company funded by the Department of Defence. We sit under the Defence Science and Technology Group. Uh, they're starting to electrify their fleet, as is everybody. And um, we've been funded to look at uh, electric vehicle battery fires and emergency response. Um, so I come from the charging sector. I've been um, in EVs for well, must be about five years now. So charging and conversions. Uh, and I'm also um, an operational firefighter with the Country Fire Authority. So the, the two interests kind of combined on this particular project. Great. And tell us a bit about EV Firesafe, what's it done and done other <laughs> organisations in the world um, like it? Uh, oh, I don't, <laughs> don't answer that one. Um, we, I don't look with the, the core of our project. So what we originally went to defence with was um, we want to look at the data, there was no data essentially. So we wanted to research um, in particular passenger electric vehicle battery fires. So when we talk about EV fires, I'm referring uh, tonight to the, the actual high voltage battery uh, being involved in fire. Any, if an electric vehicle's on fire with, with no high voltage battery, we treat it like any other uh, car yeah. fire. Um, so the core of our project is a database of every passenger electric vehicle battery fire globally since 2010. Uh, and from that, we can start to draw learnings, like how many were connected to charging, how many were in closed spaces, how many, uh, you know, experienced what we call a vapor cloud explosion, those kinds of things. And then that, that information obviously gets fed back to, uh, to Army, uh, but also to a lot of emergency response uh, agencies globally. Right. Okay. So let's start off with some definitions then. So EV stands for electric vehicle, <coughs> ice, um, internal combustion engine, petrol or diesel. What is a traction battery and is there any other type of battery in a typical EV? Yeah, sure. So we have two types of electric vehicle. We have what we call a BEV, a battery electric vehicle, and a, a FEV, a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, so PHEV. Uh, we have, our project hasn't included the mild hybrids, you know, Camry, Prius, that kind yeah. of thing. They're very small lithium battery. So the, the, what we were focused on was how many of these occur at charging and um, how can we make charging sites safer. Um, so all electric vehicles have two batteries. You still have your, your normal 12 volt accessory battery. Uh, in some electric vehicles, that's now no longer a lead acid, that's now a lithium battery itself. And then you have uh, what we call the traction battery. So the high voltage battery sits underneath the vehicle uh, between chassis rails, between the four wheels, uh, underneath the floor pan uh, of the vehicle in passenger, passenger cars. Okay, so that traction battery, that's the one that manufacturers say that it's 72 kilowatt hours, <laughs> 50 or 80 or 100 or something look like that. Now, that's a lithium ion. So there's a few similarities between that and the battery we have in our mobile phones, for example, yet quite a few differences. Is that right? Yeah, correct. So... Uh, passenger electric vehicle traction batteries, that what, what I'll probably refer to as the high voltage battery, um, can take a number of different form types and different chemistries. So we can go from anything from a cylindrical cell that looks like a, a bit bigger than a double A cell mm -hmm. to a, a prismatic, a brick style, and then the pouch cell, which is the, the type that you typically see in your phone. Um, but of course, an electric vehicle is a very large battery compared to your mobile phone. So it has a battery management system that's kind of monitoring that that pack, uh, that battery pack for for various things, but um, uh, you know, thermal management, that kind of thing. 
Yeah, because one of the things I've noticed with lighter EVs is that the management of the battery is much, much better because the battery actually uses some of its power to get itself into the right temperature and then regulate charging speed, etc. So mm. I've been looking at that from a perspective of battery life. EV manufacturers now often warrant the battery up to eight years and the life's much better than it was 10 years ago. But um, that probably also plays a, pa a part in, um, I guess, the propensity to catch on fire or not, or doesn't it? Yeah, that's the thing. That's the big question. You know, the average age of an electric vehicle globally is only around four years old. They're very young stock, but we've had Nissan Leafs, for instance, on the road in Australia for, for a decade now. Um, but while we've, you know, EVs are very young, we're, we're kind of, we, we, we have, they're very rare. So a, a passenger electric vehicle battery fire is very rare. We've been able to find less than 400 globally since 2010, and we've got 16 million of them on the road. So it's a very rare occurrence for an electric vehicle uh, traction battery or high voltage battery to actually go into what we call thermal runaway. Okay. Um, but the, 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 of course, the big question is, you know, personally, I drive a, a, I'm, I'm a Tesla Model 3 um, a driver. And what happens when my car's 20 years old and has, you know, a couple hundred thousand Ks on the clock and it's been through potholes and all of that. So that, that's, the, that's the big unknown. They're currently very rare, but what will they be like in 10, 20 years and how will we manage them? Yeah, good question. Good, good point. Now, um, let's talk about risk, because that's what a lot of people are concerned about. Now, mm. I guess we could talk about risk in many different ways, but we could say what's the probability of an electric vehicle fire? And then if one does happen, how severe is it? What's the impact, the, 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 the danger? So let's let's break that down. Let's go with the risk first. Now, this is going to be a little bit imprecise because, you know, as you say, the electrical vehicle age um, sort of um, fleet age is relatively young. ICE vehicles have been around for many, many years and ICE vehicles are less likely to catch from fire now than they were 5, 10, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So but even all of that, I mean, you are the one who's actually done the research and the numbers better than anyone else in the world. What can you tell us? What, what are those numbers telling us about the risk to catch from fire? Yeah, so I mean, the, when I say the words uh, electric vehicle, pa sorry, passenger electric vehicle battery fires are very rare. Very rare is the scientific term. It's a, I think it's a zero point zero 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 one percent chance that your electric vehicle will will have a battery thermal event, which is a way of saying fire. Um, <clears throat> so it's very at the moment very low risk. Um, but can be very high consequence. So uh, to give you an example, as a fiery, you know, if we get called to a, a mountain, kind of a rural area, as you know, and we, we get a few um, kind of dumped cars at three o'clock in the morning and people set fire to them on the back roads here. And, you know, we're typically out uh, to that call and back to the station within an hour to two hours um, to, put that, to put that car fire out and, check it's okay, get back to the station, you know, restock our breathing apparatus, equipment, that kind of thing, fill the trucks back up. An electric vehicle battery fire, uh, we don't have a really a, an average or a rule of thumb, but I would say what I say to firefighters is you're probably looking at a three to five hour minimum uh, job for this. It's a far longer um, and far more resource intensive um, uh, okay. kind of job. All right, so what I'm hearing there is that electrical <coughs> vehicles are fairly significantly less likely to catch fire than a modern ICE vehicle. But when they do catch fire, the risk or the, or the danger um, is, is greater than an ICE vehicle. Yeah, I think the risk and the danger is greater than, than an ICE vehicle because as firefighters, and I'm not talking just Australian or even, you know, um, Victorian, talking globally, we don't really yet well understand this. It's such new and emerging technology. Um, and there have been, the, the fact that there have been so few is a bit of a double-edged sword. It's great that there have been so few, but it means that we have less to kind of learn from. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think that the, the risk at the moment is around what do we do about them? How do we train everybody quickly because electric vehicles aren't coming? They're already here. Um, and and how do we get every how do we get the emergency response community more comfortable with with electric vehicle technology? And we try to share an alert, not alarmed message around. Yes, this 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 and this can happen, 
but it's very rare. And here's here are the early warning signs, for instance, and here's what other agencies globally are doing about that. And here's what we know from testing and here's what we know from research. Okay. So why would um, an electrical vehicle fire be more, I guess, intense, dangerous than an ice fire? What, what, what are the actual problems there? Yeah, sure. So a, um, a electric vehicle uh, battery fire it starts with what we call thermal runaway. So, uh, and thermal runaway is not a fire. And this is the first thing that, you know, we as fireys have to kind of get our heads around it. So it's an unstable uh, exothermic chemical reaction. So it's, it's a heat generating. Um, and in a, say, let's use the, the Tesla Model 3, most common electric vehicle in Australia, um, you may have sort of 6,000 of these uh, cylindrical cells. I've got, I usually have a prop, but I've forgotten my little, my little battery cell tonight. Okay. Uh, so we have a, these cylindrical cells. We may have, you know, six to 7,000 of these. And they're all in, their multiple cells form a, a module and then multiple modules make a pack. And that, yeah. as I said before, that sits underneath the vehicle. Mm -hmm. Now, if one cell is abused, what we call abused, let's say it's been in a collision, the cell short circuits and it heats up very rapidly. Uh, eventually kind of the, the pressure inside the cell uh, becomes so great that the cell bursts and that releases gases, that they're toxic flammable gases and that's where our fire is. But the seat of that fire is, is the, the cell itself, is that, that chemical reaction, that, that overheating chemical reaction. So your first cell goes, then the heat dissipates to the next cell and the next cell goes and so on and so forth. And it kind of keeps spreading in a domino effect, if you like. So that's that's why it takes so long. Uh, okay. So that domino effect can take a while then. It's not like if, a, um, I guess, a petrol tank <clears throat> ruptures, then it's all just going to go up in one. This can actually just sort of keep going for, for quite a while. This rupturing effect is sort of, those six, one cell in the 6,000 goes, then it goes to the next one, and then that starts to heat up, and then um, eventually that explodes and that gets to the next one, and then it keeps going slowly like that, right? Yeah, exactly. Can I can I share my screen? Is that all right? I can, sure. I can give you a bit of a, do, yeah. a look at this uh, that might be easy for everyone to kind of yeah. understand. Let's just make that a bit bigger. So... There's your, this is a presentation I give to, to emergency responders. So there's your, your, your cells and they make a, you know, a group of them make a module and then that moves into a pack and you can see the modules along here. Mm -hmm. And then everything's encased in, you know, protective metals, typically, you know, aluminium because it's nice and yeah. light. Um, <clears throat> and it sits underneath the, the vehicle. The bit I want is the next one, I think. Sorry, let me find it. So a bit of a graphic as to what's going on here. So your first cell um, is impacted, heats up, keeps heating, keeps heating, eventually bursts. Your, your toxic flammable gases then are, are vented from the cell. Now, depending on the battery state of charge, and I know you wanted to touch on that as well, um, uh, you you may get ignition, you may get flames, or you may just get off gassing. But either way, the off gassing itself, that those gases are toxic and flammable. So we, you know, obviously we don't want people breathing those in. Mm. But if the battery is over fifty percent state of charge, as a rough rule of thumb, then typically we'll, we're going to see some flames. And um, just the the gases venting from the battery cell itself. Uh, as it kind of vents out and rubs against the edge of the battery cell where it's been breached, that can be enough uh, to, to cause ignition at that point. Okay. So what happens then is because we've got these highly toxic, highly flammable gases escaping from the battery pack, they can typically escape in one direction and you get a jet of flame. So they'll escape in one direction, they'll ignite, and they'll get this kind of jet of flame uh, that... Um, we see, you know, reasonably commonly with, with electric vehicle battery fires. Yeah. Well, could you just go back to the previous slide? Sure. Right. Uh, this one? Uh, no, the previous one um, and the one before that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think this diagram is good because it shows that the battery mm -hmm. just isn't 
like your mobile phone battery, there's actually modules there it's de developed to a high standard and it's got um, protection around it, etc. Mm -hmm. So really want to kind of stress that, yes, it's, it's a lithium ion battery, but it's not like the one in household electronics, which are really designed not to last any longer than two or three years because then you're going to buy a new phone anyway. Um, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's the same base technology, but implemented in quite a different way. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay, good. So um, if we have a, let's say that we've got a vehicle with a um, high state of charge, you know, 80, 90%, um, and um, it, it catches fire, um, how long um, would that perhaps take to put out? Um, and I, I've heard, for example, that, um, you know, it could be initially be quelled, but then the vehicle's got to be monitored for 24, 48 hours, maybe taken back to a depot and placed somewhere where it can't, um, it can't reignite. Whereas with an ICE car, once it's out, it's out, and then you don't need to worry about it reigniting 24 hours later on. Yeah, so um, reignition or what we call secondary ignition occurs in about 10% of the, the cases we researched. So, yeah, it, it's certainly something that we need to be aware of. So essentially what's happened there is if we talk again about the one cell's been abused, um, that's got into that thermal runaway process. Um, during the initial collision, there may be more than one cell abused. So we may have, let's say, three. So the first cell short circuits and heats up and goes into thermal runaway, there's ignition, we arrive, what we've got to do is uh, suppress the flames and then cool the battery pack. So by cooling the battery pack, um, uh, what I'm talking about there is we, we literally get water onto the underside of the vehicle. And what we're attempting to do is dissipate the heat out of the, the battery <clears throat> pack so it doesn't propagate to the other cells. So the heat doesn't spread to other cells and continue that chain, that kind of domino effect. So once we've cooled the battery, and as I said, that can, you know, it's not uncommon for us to hear of a three to five hour cooling process. Mm -hmm. And it's not uncommon for us to hear about, um, you know, it's a 24 hour job. Uh, and chatting to the guys in Manchester um, in the UK a few weeks, a few months ago now, they had an, um, an Audi e-tron that went into thermal runaway and it was a 30 hour job in total. So 10 tankers with four crew each time. So you can already see, you know, the amount of the, the amount of resources that, uh, that we need to potentially throw at this. So about a five hour cooling process, but then they had to, they called Audi and they got a tech out and they were monitoring the battery pack for, for any other heat in other parts of the battery pack. Um, they struggled to find a toey that would take it, that kind of thing. So, you know, there's, these things can typically uh, take a little while to do. Okay. And then what about the intensity of the fire? So, for example, um, I, I'm into circuit racing and, yeah, it's not at all uncommon for vehicles to, to catch fire um, on smoke. Well, on circuits where you have to have fire extinguisher on board and, you know, um, fireproof socks and every, everything else. Um, mm -hmm. And if something does catch on fire, you put it out, you drag it off, and then the day continues. Um, I have heard that EV fires can burn so intensely and heat can actually damage the, uh, the, the concrete or, or the track, um, in which case that really would be a problem. Is there any truth to that, um, that the fire can be that intense? Yeah, because because you've got so when when a petrol or diesel car catches fire, it's kind of a you know hit, the thermal release is in all directions. You get a three hundred and sixty kind of uh, flame essentially. With you know as we talked about just now, the with an electric vehicle, you get that directional uh, jet of flame, um, which can be uh, up to twenty seven hundred degrees is what we think we know at the moment. So uh, a petrol or diesel car may burn at sort of eight hundred to a thousand. Mm -hmm. So because it's directional and, and intensified in that way, it's a lot hotter and we get that kind of uh, jet of flame, as I say. So when that hits something, it has the potential to do more damage. However, having said that, um, we, we can't, that's the theory. We can't prove that at the moment. We can't really, I can't point to anything to say, yes, it definitely creates more concrete spalling in an underground space than a petrol or diesel car would. All of that's yet to be tested and, and better understood. Okay, so we'll leave that as a potential uh, as yet unproven. I guess we need to find someone willing to sacrifice their electric vehicle. And we'll, we'll just, <laughs> Won't be me. Well, to be honest, I mean, this should be done. I mean, ANCAP um, 
you know, wrecks many good cars per year, why would we not do this um, and, you know, get an ice vehicle whilst we're at it, set them on fire and let's see what happens. I mean, I think I think it's mm. worth doing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's some testing um, in, in process with Fire Rescue New South Wales. So uh, I think Dan's on the call tonight who's from from uh, from up in Sydney. And um, uh, so that's exactly what we'll be doing is, is a simulated underground car park and, and setting fire to some some cars or some packs some battery packs and um and and actually testing some of these theories we have okay well, i'd love to be able to see that now mm -hmm. i want to come back to to that concept of abuse because what you said was and also what i've read is that a single cell or perhaps more than one cell but, but at least one or more um could be abused and that could be damaged now you gave the example there, as others have done, of being in a in an accident. Um, yep. So you could potentially have a vehicle in an accident, or maybe not even in an accident. Maybe it's been knocked or something like that, or whatever the case may be. Uh, driving around with a potential fire risk. So that would beg the question that if an EV is involved in damaged and its battery should be replaced or checked or tested in some way to minimize the chance of there being an abused cell which could lead to a fire would, would that be logical yeah i think so so um we we do try to track causes of battery cell abuse in the incidents we we have so um we have a lot of unknowns as all there always are mm -hmm. um collision and debris <clears throat> so collisions obvious debris uh, in one incident, for instance, uh, a tow ball fell off a truck and then bounced along the road, hit the underside of an electric vehicle, and, and that was enough to, to, to abuse the battery. Mm -hmm. um, we've had a number of incidents. We had a spike through 2019 and 2020, which were due to a fault during the battery manufacture. So it was an LG Chem battery that mm -hmm. actually had a fault while they were they were making them. Then, of course, we've got things like arson, um, uh, things like you know the the cut the, the electric vehicle was in a, a garage and the garage caught fire those sorts of things the the emerging exposure that we're seeing is around workshops and repair centers because there's no such thing as going to become an EV technician you know yet you know tapes are working on it but uh, at the moment we're seeing a number of of, of workshops having uh, uh, battery fires because they're you know they're potentially hoisting in the wrong spot or there's something else that's happened uh, to, to cause that. But certainly if, if an electric vehicle is involved in any kind of incident for any EV drivers, um, you know, on the call, um, uh, look, it, these battery packs can take enormous abuse before, they, they don't just automatically burst into flames. They can take an enormous amount of abuse and we see a lot of um, incidents involving EVs shared on social media. Um, but certainly if, if you're a driver uh, and you suspect you've had some damage to the battery, yeah, you, you want to get that checked pretty quickly and don't charge it in the meantime. And this was an interesting point during the, the flooding up in New South Wales over the past sort of you know, three to six months. Um, an electric vehicle that's been submerged, particularly in salt water, has increased risk of, of battery Absolutely. fire. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, now this actually leads on to something interesting because another one of my areas of speciality is four-wheel driving. And um, the amount of damage the underside of a four-wheel drive can take is immense to the point we have UBP, underbody protection. Um, and, um, you know, I've certainly dented my fair share of, of fuel tanks. Um, so EV four-wheel drive manufacturers need to make sure that the um, battery is well and truly protected because there's a lot of damage coming out. And also the hoisting question point is really interesting as well. Um, certainly there's been many vehicles, if you hoist them in the wrong place, you'll damage them. Um, but yes, uh, that's interesting as well. And certainly if you're off-road and changing oil. So yeah, I'm going to add that to my list of things about EV four-wheel drives. Um, excellent. <laughs> sure. Um, now, um, let's talk about home charging now as well, because many people will charge their EVs at home. When I've had EVs on test as a journalist, I've never needed to go to a public charge. I have because that's part of the job, but I've not needed to. I mm. just charge off my 10 amp. Now, um, I don't have an EV um, charging point at home. I just charge off a 10 amp. I try not to use a extension cord because, you know, ampage in there. So, but um, do you have any statistics um, as to 
how likely um, an EV fire is if you just plug your EV in at home? Um, is that a risk for people? Uh, look, it can be if you have, you know, an older home with old wiring, that kind of thing. Typically, you know, it would, it would just trip a fuse, but, um, but it, it's a tricky thing. So most of the time you're going to be absolutely fine to plug into your 10 amp. You, you just normal PowerPoint with your, your car. And of course, that's a very slow charge. Um, when you start adding in things like um, extension cords, they have to be rated to the right, you know, kind of amperage, that kind of thing. And that doesn't always happen. And I've seen, you know, pictures where people have daisy chained extension cords and oh, to, to yeah. plug. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you just start to kind of heat everything up. Look, I can't, the, the, the only one I can really point to is actually the very first incident we, we ever, um, that, that ever occurred, which was a converted um, uh, Nissan on a ship, uh, on a ferry, passenger ferry off the coast of Norway. And the owner had, um, it had been like a home conversion along with a, a company that were doing that kind of thing. Uh, but he'd also manufactured his own charging cable. Okay. Uh, and then plugged it in on a passenger ferry and surprise, surprise, it caught fire, but um, or went into thermal runaway. So look, we the manuf when you read the manufacturer's owner's manual or um, emergency response guide, it does often say don't charge with an extension cord. Mm. But I think the risk there is 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 very low. But I don't, I don't, that doesn't mean I can I can tone people plugging it straight in and maybe get your electrician to check your check your you know your wiring and and ask that question am i okay to, to actually plug an electric vehicle it's a it's a bigger it's a big electrical appliance right so um yeah and get it, it get it checked out yeah exactly it's not just a fire so <laughs> everything i've talked to i've researched on this and taking to electricians it's basically look if you're going to be charging your ev and at home um get your electrical system checked out and if necessary mm -hmm upgraded um even if it preferably to a three phase or something like, like that and just particularly as you say if it's an older home uh fire, fire risk or not and that, if you are concerned one thing you can do um with electric vehicles is just change the current draw from 10 amps down to five and then that will mm. reduce it um as well and then also maybe set it for only to charge during times that you're awake or at home so so there's things you can do to, to minimize that risk but you know thousands of thousands of people do it and there's, there's not been yeah so, yeah. yeah that's it and the other the other point to make there is that when you have your electrician actually put in a dedicated wall charger so you know like a seven kilowatt charger it's you know it's installed it should be installed to as3000 the australian wiring rules mm -hmm. and if it's an electrically compliant unit means it has the rcm tick and you should always ask the the supplier that you're getting it from that whether or not it has australian electrical compliance uh, and installed to AS3000, then we have a theory on what happens with that unit if the car goes into thermal runaway. So charging may not cause the battery fire, but yeah. let's say the EV goes into thermal runaway while it's connected to a, to a charger. We have a theory about what happens at that point. And this, these are the theories we're testing, and they're really important for firefighters because if we put water onto downed power lines, for instance, we become the earth and we electrocute ourselves. So we need to be cautious of what we're doing. If we've got a, a lithium, an electric vehicle lithium battery uh, in thermal runaway over here and potentially an energised electrical fire over here with the charging unit, we can't just spray water willy-nilly because we, we're running the risk of electrocuting ourselves. So if everything is compliant, installed to AS3000, the theory is that the, the unit will cut the power from the distribution board meaning we're a bit safer. We can arrive on scene and we know we're a little bit safer if it's all done properly. So, yeah, it's a really important point. It's not just about, you know, make, keeping yourself safe and, and obviously put a smoke detector in the area you're going to charge as well. It's about keeping the emergency responders who are going to attend a bit safer as well. Right, so then that sounds like just yet more reasons to install what's known as an EVSE or charging point at your home as opposed to just plugging it into the wall. And, you know, the way things are going, if you do that as a homeowner, all you're going to be doing is adding value to your home as opposed to decreasing it. And, um, yeah, so all sorts of reasons. That, and then you can get really clever with charging. And some of the charges will figure out whether um, the solar panel, solar power is being uh, p p provided and then only charge the car of solar if you need it for a long time. So there's all sorts of cleverness you, you can do there. But yeah, mm. it sounds like the fire risk is a good thing. Mm. Now, um, 
I was reading on your website and I was very intrigued to learn about the risk of regen. So regen is sort of for regeneration. When an electric uh, an EV slows down, then those motors turn from providing propulsion to the wheels to generators and sending charge back to the batteries. This is a good thing because it harvests energy and extends your range. Um, however, what um, I was reading was saying that let's say we've got an EV and um, it is being pulled onto a tow truck and the wheels are rotating, therefore that would um, put the motors into regen mode and that could potentially re-spark a fire. I found that very intriguing. Has that actually happened or is this a theoretical risk? It's, uh, look, it's uh, both. It's happened and it's theoretical. <laughs> so we have a number You'll of... You'll have to explain uh, that one, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we have a number of... So with the secondary ignition event, so that's where we've had a battery and thermal runaway. It's been on fire. It's been suppressed. The battery's been cooled. That thermal runaway's been cooled and stopped. Then we load it onto a tow truck. Uh, and then we get a second fire, a second thermal event. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's actually of the 10% of cases, uh, it's roughly kind of 25 cases globally since 2010. Uh, sorry, 25 to 30 cases, roughly around that kind of number. Um, I'd say probably half of those were while the vehicle was getting loaded onto the tow truck. So it's completely off the top of my head. I'd need to check those, those actual numbers. Um, now, it could have happened anyway because there's a second cell that was abused in the initial collision or whatever happened, and then we've we've knocked that or jolted it as it's been you know dragged up onto a tow truck. But with um, uh, but as you said, when you uh, use when the wheels turn and feed that bit of power back into the battery pack, and there's a change in the state of charge, that can be enough to then send that you know the second cell into thermal runaway so we it's happened a, a, a few times while it's being loaded onto the truck and i've got some great photos of of tow trucks and and, and actually you know tow trucks kind of uh, with a burning ev on the back and we have we have yeah, that, that, that would be one unimpressed tories oh I'll tell you what yeah I've, I've met some unimpressed tories in my life <laughs> but yeah I, I i would yeah <laughs> <laughs> well we've also got you kind of joking aside we've got four tow truck drivers who've been injured by by a secondary yeah. ignition so and no firefighters have yet touched wood but certainly that the tories who are not wearing the same kind of ppc as we are um have been injured in in those events so um it is a serious risk and um uh, whether or not it's just the jolting of the vehicle maybe it's being skull dragged onto the the truck or whether it's actually oh, regen. Do that. come on come on yeah no no i've never seen them do that but uh but again like the tesla model 3 i think all teslas have it actually has a tow mode so if you can yeah. use the dash and and puts it in tow mode which just lets the, the wheels free spin Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, speaking of which, then, um, I mean, you've got to assume that if the thing's been on fire, then it's not going to work. You almost need some form of mechanical disconnect just to make the wheels kind of freewheeling. And then that's a really obvious sort of, I don't know, reach under the bonnet, pull a lever as opposed because, you know, um, Elon Musk's nice big 15 inch touchscreen <laughs> is not going to be working, is it? Let's face it. So, uh, yeah, it, it can do. Uh, uh, Dan, who's on the call, has a story about um, I think it worked initially and then when they tried to get it off the tow truck, it stopped working and all kinds of shenanigans. But yeah. look, it, that would be great. I, I know in the UK, the the whatever they are, the, the UK roadside assist group, mm. AA, are they? Um, they've, oh, yeah. Yeah. they've um, started, they can actually take the rear wheels off an electric vehicle. They actually jack it on the spot, take the rear wheels off and put a like free wheelers on kind of like the almost the space saver type of tires um in order to get that same effect but um well that would only work if it's rear wheel drive if it's four wheel drive you're going to have to do yeah. all four wheels so. yeah well typically they'll they'll lift the front and just have the two oh, wheels right. on yeah. yeah or dolly wheel them that kind of thing but um depends how far and how fast they've got to go kind of thing so hmm. Yeah. Wow. So, so, so there's a lot to it, isn't there? Now, something else. Um, so you've talked about the vast amounts of water that are needed mm. over an extended period of time. Now, this water is being dispensed over a vehicle full of 
toxic chemicals which are burning. So then we've got a potential environmental hazard of all that runoff, don't we? Yeah, that again, that's the theory. Um, there are two big incidents we can point to. One is the Stavanger Airport in Norway. Um, it was a, uh, a multi-level car park that collapsed due to a uh, to a, a car fire. It was actually a petrol car that started it. But given Norway's high number of electric vehicles, um, you know the water runoff and um, uh, various other you know particulate and air monitoring tests were done and found there was no additional uh, kind of um, you know toxicity other than you'd find typically with petrol or diesel cars. And then, of course, the Victorian big battery fire uh, just down the road from me here. Um, I actually spent three days at that one, uh, which was a Tesla mega pack. So exactly the same battery cells, just in a like a shipping container kind of thing. Mm. Um, and we we used uh, it was about a million liters over the course of three days on, on that on that particular fire to protect exposures. And that was tested and found again to not contain sort of uh, levels, you know, toxic to, to humans. I mean, they went great, but it wasn't something to be overly okay. concerned about. So again, the kind of, it's a, it, again, that's the theory. There is too few incidents and uh, uh, tests that we'd be able to point to. But of course, um, again, that that testing program with virus in New South Wales will yeah. help us answer some of that. But a million litres of water, that's a million kilograms. That's a lot of water to, to get mm. to a single fire and transport it and yeah, that, that, that's quite an effort, isn't it? Yeah, it was, um, they only had 44,000 litres on site, which was yeah. just to, to suppress any grass fires. So we actually ended up running it about, about I think it was about 2.1 kilometres up the road. So it was a, it was a big job, but, um, <clears throat> uh, but the, if to, to be fair, you know, big job, it was one of those, you know, just the, everything aligned to kind of create that situation and, um, Tesla, of, Tesla and um, Noyan, who are the owners of that site, have worked really hard to make sure it never happens again. So they've, they've been really quite responsive to it. Yeah. Okay. Now, question from um, Enid Sponza is, um, let's say that a fire starts, and I'm going to paraphrase it here, and um, thermal runway, runway is happening. Um, is there a way to potentially quickly discharge the batteries to, to mm. reduce it. Um, maybe there isn't, but is that something which, which could help if we could sort of quickly dissipate the charge into batteries? Uh, there's not, unfortunately. Um, look, I know that uh, I think the guys in Queensland are working on something. Um, <clears throat> and Tesla, actually, we went to visit their workshop last week in Sydney, uh, which was fascinating. Saw my first Tesla Roadster. Um, they actually have uh, what they described as essentially a box. It, I think it boils water uh, is the, the kind of theory behind it. But you're talking to discharge a battery where it's not actually putting kilometres on the car. Mm. Um, uh, it will take a very long time. Um, so it's, um, it's not something that's currently doable and it would be tricky based on whether you need a type one or type two kind of port to plug into the charge port, where the charge port is on the car, whether it's accessible, if the car's been involved in a collision, are we actually going to be able to plug something in? Um, so, you know, it, it, is, a, it is actually uh, an option for us as firefighters. If, we, if we've determined we've got an electric vehicle with a battery and thermal runaway and on fire, mm -hmm. it is an option for us to just let that burn hot and fast and get rid of all that, that what we call stranded energy. So all those cells that are, you know, still have, have power and or voltage in them. So, which goes against the grain, you know, for, for yeah. us as firefighters, we, and, and doesn't, it's not a great PR look either, you know, we're there to, with a big tank of, tanker of water to, and hoses to put stuff out. Um, to, so to kind of stand there and just let it burn is, um, yeah, kind of a, a foreign but, but concept. But it makes sense. I mean, if you dumped, let's say, two tanker loads into a fire and then you knew that was, wasn't going to put it out mm. and it'd just be pointless, it makes sense just to let it burn down to a point yeah. where those two tanker loads could actually finish it off as opposed to kind of make, make no point. Uh, um, mm. To it. So it does make sense, yeah. Yeah. So, okay, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit now. So there's a whole bunch of, of risks and potentials here. What changes would you like to see to EVs to minimise the risk of fires um, and then make them easier to deal with 
once they start. So, for example, we discussed having some form of lever you could pull to completely disconnect regen so you could tow it. Um, maybe there's another lever to pull to, you know, rapid discharge the batteries or um, some form of legislation that could come in to sort of do checks after a um, known impact to check for battery abuse. Um, I don't know, anything look like that to say, okay, here's how we could how we could do better here. From the manufacturers? Yeah, the manufacturers and operators and uh, uh, there's so there's well look, there's really low hanging fruit. The first thing would be they they all build emergency response guides to an international standard, which is great, but the emergency response guides can be confusing. And um, sometimes I think that some of the manufacturers don't actually understand their own emergency response guide. Uh, I would like to see the manufacturers uh, reach out to or, or kind of work closer with, closely with, um, you know, not, not specifically me and my company, but the emergency response community. So, you know, I don't want to sound like too much of a Tesla fangirl here, but they've just hired a former battalion chief, uh, Kathleen McCafferty, to actually be that interface between the emergency response community and, and Tesla as a manufacturer, which is great. GM have started doing emergency responder training, but only in the US. Mm -hmm. um, I want the manufacturers to, what would be lovely is if, if the manufacturers actually think about their what that emergency response should be, they often say things like use a lot of water but they don't say where or how much water or how we should do that or, you know, and, and I think the manufacturers, uh, like this is probably getting a bit too um, high level, but I think the manufacturers should be, as, as we said before, giving us some cars to firstly cut up. We need to learn how to extricate people from these cars. And as we, just before this, we were talking about, I've just been up to Tamworth to watch the road rescue, Australasian road rescue organization conference. We need to train rest road rescuers on how to extricate people from these vehicles. And then we need to know how they burn and we need to get people around them as they burn and actually work out, you know, what's the best way of handling these and what's the best way of keeping charging sites, you know, cars, EVs that, you know, um, go into thermal runaway while connected to charging. What's the safe way to, to handle those? How can we mitigate risk there? So um, that'd probably be the first things is, is, um, uh, you know, actually giving us some of these cars, the wrecked ones are fine. <laughs> We're happy with those. I mean, trying to get your hands on a, a wrecked, a written off EV is like trying to get gold dust at the moment. You know, they, they, uh, a Tesla will sell for twenty, thirty thousand dollars even if it's been written off. So yeah. it's incredibly difficult for um, emergency agencies to actually get a hands on these things. Yeah, look, I'd call on ANCAP to, um, to do it. I mean, I think really this is yeah, important. we've and, we've and, had a know, chat with them. Yeah, and, and I think the, um, the the thing is, even if the risk is quite low, it's a it's a big risk in people's minds, and for that reason alone, it's mm. worth looking at. Yeah. Okay. So now, obviously, first responders and EVs is a massive, massive topic, and um, multi days of training, etc. But I'm going to ask you for your three top tips mm. anyway. So compress a week's worth of knowledge and training into three top tips. <laughs> An emergency responder who's used to dealing with, with um, ice car fires, what, what are the three or four things you, you, you'd say to them? Sure. The first thing is electrocution risk is very low. It's, a, it's an islanded or a floating DC circuit. And we have this old kind of thing of electricity and water doesn't mix. And, and there's a lot of concern around in the emergency response community around if we put water on this, we're going to be electrocuted. So uh, we found no cases of electrocution or even near miss with with um, with any incident that we've researched. Uh, the second thing is understand where the battery pack is located in an electric vehicle and um, and thermal that idea of thermal runaway. So it's it's all about battery pack construction, where it's located, what is thermal runaway. Because once we under once firefighters understand those two things, it just kind of it's I find that that's the key. It just kind of unlocks that that you get that moment of, oh, right, okay, I kind of get that now. Uh, you know, all these stories in the media, they go, oh, well, that's why that's happened. And when you understand something, obviously it's um, it's far better. And then the third thing is actually three things. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to cheat here. The, th the third thing is three things, the three eyes. So 
learn to identify an electric vehicle and, and we yep. cover that a lot in various things that we various webinars that we do um, learn how to immobilize it because they're silent you're not going to hear engine noise and you need to make sure it's not going to move unexpectedly so know how to put a car into park um, chock the wheels that kind of thing and then learn how to isolate those high voltage systems so that's different in every electric vehicle so in a tesla you have a cut loop you cut the cut loop the high voltage system isolates mm -hmm. in other things it's a pull fuse or that kind of thing but the important point there as well is that when an electric vehicle has been involved in a collision it will automatically it should automatically isolate its high voltage system so it should automatically isolate the, the pack from the rest of the car the battery pack so sorry that was cheating i think that was about oh, was, seven was seven things in three uh, uh, <laughs> seven things in three just just briefly oh so, yeah okay no look um that that is fantastic now um question from john it's a good good one um are there any warning signs before a fire starts great question yeah yeah so uh we were covering this off um Oh, I've, I still sound a bit croaky, actually. Four days of talking at the the um, the Arrow Conference, the Road Rescue Conference, plus a couple of big nights of drinking with firefighters. Remind me never to do that again. Um, was, uh, we covered this off again and again and again. So the early signs of thermal runaway. So when we talk about those battery cells and they burst and we get those gases coming out of them. So the early signs are um, you'll if, if there's a, uh, someone there with a thermal imaging camera and it's safe to kind of have a get the, the thermal imaging camera onto the battery pack, look for the, the hot spots because that's, you know, a sign that, you know, you've got something heating up under there. Popping noises. So that popping of the, the as the battery cells burst, they'll make a popping noise. Now, when I say popping, it's often described as gunshots, particularly, you know, in American incidents, someone will ring 911 and go, someone's, someone's shooting from a car, but it's not, it's those battery cells bursting yeah. and then hissing and whistling. So it's uh, those gases escaping under pressure. So if you've got as far as you've got a bit of heat uh, and it's rapidly rising, um, you're hearing popping noises and you're starting to hear hissing and whistling at that point, it's, it's too late and um, you need to, get out of the way mm. essentially at that point then you start to see the vapor clouds and the vapor clouds can be you know huge you're talking um it's it's up to six thousand liters of toxic flammable gas per one kilowatt hour battery capacity of the vehicle so if you're my tesla's i think 54 kilowatt hours so you can imagine it's just this enormous kind of uh, cloud of, of toxic flammable gases and in some of the more recent incidents we've seen uh, there have been deaths due to inhalation of those gases rather than the actual fire. So, yeah, so there's the, they're the early signs. So any emergency responders, that's they're the the things we're hammering home. Is here are the early signs, and we've got some great videos around that as well. So okay, great. Now, um, yeah, do you think that EV should have fire suppressants? If I go back to motorsport, for example, um, we carry a blue triangle on all. Uh, motorsport cars and that blue triangle is placed over the battery so that way the first responders know where the battery is if, if, there, if there's a fire now in an ev the whole thing would be a battery um so the you know blue triangle is kind of redundant in a way but um would i be for all the battery vehicles i've seen that, uh, that are bevs pure battery it's it's as you said earlier um between the four wheels low down in the chassis. I found that with the PHEVs, the hybrids, the battery typically isn't there. It's generally um, right at the back behind the behind the rear mm. wheels. And that's normally where you'd find it. Is that what you found as well? Uh, yeah. Look, they they kind of. Um, they, I guess the commonality, and we try to make it simple when talking to emergency responders, is it's under that floor pan. Mm. Uh, can be further towards the back, or you know, take up that whole floor pan space. Yeah, okay. Mm. All right. Now, we talked um, before we started about scooters because we're seeing a lot of mm. e um, electrical scooters now and, and the like. Um, and these aren't <clears throat> very well regulated. So when a car comes onto the market from Tesla or Hyundai, you know there's been a lot of engineering and safety gone into it. You can buy that product with confidence. Now, we're not going to talk about the legality of these vehicles, whether they're motorbikes or scooters or whatever else. That's a completely separate discussion. But um, I believe you, you said that they are actually very unsafe in some ways. 
Yeah, look, uh, electric, what we call, what I, I term as light electric vehicles. So your electric bikes, scooters, uh, skateboards and unicycles. Mm -hmm. um, motorbikes, you know, what we traditionally consider a motorbike, you know, Harley, Harley Davidson, Livewire, that kind of thing we're, we're not talking about here. But the light, light electric vehicles, particularly e-bikes and e-scooters from reputable companies that, you know, have tested and, uh, you know, actually gone through some kind of compliance, uh, you know, some adhere to some kind of Australian or international standard, typically very safe. But we're seeing this flood of cheap imports, essentially, and, you know, glossy websites set up with, there's, there's one that I, I specifically hate, which is, you know, has these two kind of dudes, Randy and Jerry or whatever the names are, who like these California dudes, but actually it's a company owned purely in China uh, that are shipping all over the world. And these, these um, that the problem with these light electric vehicles uh, is that you can take the pack away from the frame of the, the, the actual vehicle itself, put it on the kitchen bench and charge it. And what we're seeing is, I think, the start of a spike in Australia of, uh, of house fires and deaths caused by light electric vehicles. And again, it's an, an alert, not alarmed message. You know, it, it's, um, I don't want to kind of uh, blacklist every light electric vehicle. I think they have a place, they're the reputable ones. Mm. But we're seeing, as I say, we're seeing the, the cheap rubbish come through. And we've already had our first Australian death uh, due to due to a, a charging e-scooter. Um, and we, we haven't really talked about vapour cloud explosion, but essentially what happened with this particular incident is a, it's a very small battery pack. So your Tesla's 54 kilowatt hours, electric scooter, typically one to two kilowatt hours. Tiny, yeah. But the a young couple in Brisbane who were living in a caravan actually charged an e-scooter battery on the kitchen bench using a cable that didn't come with the, the scooter they just used a cable they had to hand and overnight it went into thermal runaway so when it overcharged one of the battery cells um heated short circuited heated up those gases escaped from the battery cells and that actually uh, caused an explosion rather than just ignition it caused an actual explosion um, and the young man uh, passed away from his injuries the following day and his partner gave birth. She was heavily pregnant, uh, gave birth while in a coma. So they're both only 22 years old. So we're seeing, um, I'm seeing an increase in the number of light electric vehicle incidents. Uh, we've had the first death. I, th I think we'll see a few more in Australia. We've, we're seeing a number of homes being burnt down. Uh, we're seeing a, a real spike in the number overseas as well. So in Argentina, about two or three weeks ago, a mother and her four children were killed uh, due to inhalation from a, a charging e-skateboard. The New York Fire Department have um, reportedly had 100 separate e-bike or e-scooter fires this year alone. Most of those are multiple units that have gone up. Um, the, the, one of the CFA uh, brigades that I'm, uh, I'm I'm chatting to in a few weeks have had uh, two light electric vehicle battery fires in the space of three weeks. Yeah, it's, that's one brigade in Victoria. So what's you know what else is happening? And the problem is that um, as firefighters, when we report back to you know we arrive on scene and we report back and we we have to kind of almost tag this as this is a lithium battery event. Otherwise, it kind of gets missed. And so we just don't know how many are actually happening with these smaller vehicles. But, um, but I, the, the, the big piece of advice I give to anyone watching is don't charge them inside. If you've damaged your, your bike or your e-bike e or e-scooter, you know, because these things kick up and down curbs all the time and they're pretty, you know, roughly used, always supervise the charging, only use the, the manufacturer's charging cable and, and just be really careful with them. They're, um, they can be very deadly, even though they're a very small battery. Yeah, and I think um, operator knowledge and education's got a bit to do with it. So um, um, I've got some radio controlled 
um, cars and use mm -hmm. um, lithium-ion batteries in that. And one of the things I read early on is be very careful when you charge them. Um, you know, do it when you're awake in a well-ventilated area. Don't charge them and walk off. Kind of supervise mm -hmm. the charging, um, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, because 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 there, there is that that risk there. Um, and it sounds to me very much the same sort of um, thing here, um, mm -hmm. particularly with, with with the with the lower quality goods. So um, yeah, mm -hmm. that, that, that that's great to know. Okay, so that, that's time. In. Um, Emma, thank you very much indeed for taking the time. Um, for those watching on YouTube, thank you for watching this. And um, please all do all the like, subscribe, share stuff. And you can find a lot more information about EVs on my channel, including towing and road tests and analysis of how well they go off-road.